biblical scripture, the doubling of something means the surety of that. So the doubling, these stories have that same theme coming through. This, and, and to the listeners of these stories, to the readers of these stories, this would emphasize the surety that God is sovereign over all kings. But there's also some differences, obviously, between the stories. So the accusers in chapter 3 were the astrologers, and in 6, the administrators. In chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar witnessed the fourth figure in the fiery furnace. And in chapter 6, the king spent the night worrying about Daniel until he learned what happened in the next morning. So there's, there's obvious differences as well. <clears throat> there's also a lot of wordplay in, in here that we lose in English. The, the repetition of, of words and phrases also emphasizes um, the important themes. It's, it was also a way for folks to memorize these stories, for them to engage in that, uh, in that emphasis. So stories that encouraged them, stories that provided comfort to later generations who also experienced persecution, persecution from earthly powers and people. So I use, you know, I use the word a lot. I use the word stories a lot. I've used it in Genesis, I used it here. That doesn't mean they were just like storybook. We tell our family story. We tell our family history. Stories as in this is what happened to God's people. God, sovereign God, and how his people were faithful to him or not. Those stories of faith. So, we know from chapter 5, you've got your Bibles open, Persia had taken control of Babylon and established its power, but the narrative of Daniel continues. He's still there, and it, it's illustrating how he continued to function in his role in that foreign land, faithfully obeying the rules of the land, and remaining faithful to Yahweh. So, there, there's this sort of setup of um, almost will there be a conflict in Daniel? Will he remain faithful to the king or to God? Uh, he was threatened, falsely accused, and condemned. So we're going to start with 628, the end of that chapter. So... Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. That's, that's the point made. Daniel prospered during the reign. So God, we're going to look at some scripture here. Um, that, did I use the word intertextuality last week? <laughs> All the places where scripture connects. Inter, in the Bible, textuality. All the texts that connect to each other. So, Second Chronicles 36, 22 and 23. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. Any of his people among you may go up, and may the Lord their God be with them. So Daniel, we haven't gotten, to, Daniel 6, we haven't gotten to that point yet. But that's your connection into Second Chronicles, talking about the king. Jeremiah 25. <clears throat> Jeremiah 25, verse 12. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians, for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. So Jeremiah is making a prophecy as well. And chapter 29, starting in verse 10, this is the letter from God. To those in exile. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. And here's that verse again. 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So we're connecting this, these stories here in Daniel to the rest of the biblical texts. Not all of them, just some of them. Isaiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah being contemporaries, Isaiah 44, 24 through 28. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer who formed you in the womb, I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense, who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited of the towns of Judah, they shall be rebuilt, and of their ruins, I will restore them, and says to the watery deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. So establishing even Cyrus is, is under God's command. Cyrus may not know that, <laughs> but God is in control and will fulfill all of his prophecies. I also want to read Isaiah 45, 1 to 5, but I'm reading it from uh, my, the Jewish Bible I have called the Stone Edition. Thus said Hashem, so wherever the, the, we have capital letters Lord in our Bible, that's the name of God, they, they would say Hashem. Thus said Hashem to his anointed one, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped. So God's right hand is power. Power of God. Everywhere you read that, right hand of God. God's right hand is taking hold of Cyrus's right hand. The powerful king's hand. God's power. Oh, I already read that. Oh, uh, to subdue nations before him that I might loosen the loins of kings. So if you're following along, the NIV reads there, to strip kings of their armor. But to loosen or to gird the loins means to, to put on courage and strength and get out there ready to go. To loosen the loins means to lose strength and courage. So the NIV, to strip kings of their armors, doesn't have quite the weight to it that to loosen the loins of their strength. Um, to open doors before him and that gateways not be shut. I will go before you and straighten the twisting paths. I will smash copper doors and sever iron bolts. I, and I grant you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. So the notes in my stone Bible says, the riches that the Babylonians had hidden in dark places. In order that you should know that I am Hashem, who has proclaimed your name, I, the God of Israel, for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen one, I have proclaimed you by name, I dubbed you, though you did not know me. Know me refers to covenant love. I am Hashem, and there is no other. Other than me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you did not know me. I thought that was really poetic and carried a weight that I didn't feel in the NIV text. And Ezra 1, you can read it home. <laughs> that is after Cyrus sent them back and uh, set them free to go back. Cyrus is God's agent. History Channel. This is um, from the History Channel. No, that's from Bible Odyssey. But the History Channel says this. Through far-reaching military conquests and benevolent rule, Cyrus the Great transformed a small group of semi-nomadic tribes into the mighty Persian Empire, the ancient world's first superpower in less than 15 years. So we have modern day parts whoops, of Pakistan and Afghanistan and Iran and Iraq and Syria, Jordan, Israel, Egypt, and Turkey. So that 15 years, military conquest, that's pretty impressive. 
So, six, one of three. Daniel's success. <coughs> it pleased Darius. Again, we talked last week that there's no archaeological evidence of Darius the king at this time. There was a Darius later on, after, after Cyrus had, had died. Um, but at this point, this Darius is connected to Cyrus. That's, that's the way the Jewish people understand it. Uh, there was, to a point, 120 satraps. A satrap was a governor of provinces. So we have the governor of Virginia, and then there are counties, and there are leaders in the counties, so a satrap would be like that. Uh, those satraps ruled throughout his kingdom. So 120 satraps through all of that, that map we just saw, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Oh boy. <laughs> Darius's edict, Daniel's response. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. What a testimony of someone who serves a foreign oppressive government. Does his best. Does his best. A man of integrity whose abilities come from God as all his previous testimonies have stated. Verse 5. Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Now, I had to stop and really think about that statement. The only vulnerability they can find lies in his commitment. The power of God over the power of earthly leaders and spiritual forces. That's our biblical theme that runs through the whole, whole text of the Bible. I could preach a sermon just on verse 5 alone. The only basis for charges against this man will have to do with something about his obedience to his own God. Verse 6. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king. They had access to the king because they needed to report what was going on in the provinces. And they said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed. And that might be a stretch. Have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. They put a lot of thought into that plot. It was a blasphemous law for God, uh, more blasphemous than what Belshazzar did with the temple vessels. And 30 days, I thought 30 days, I guess that'd be like uh, issuing, for this month, we're having this thing. <laughs> Just long enough for them to catch Daniel doing something. A holiday of sorts. Which would fuel pride in the king, I would think. Everybody's going to pray to me during this month. Verse 9, so King Darius put the decree in writing. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem three times a day. He got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. So the Old Testament does not, does not uh, ordain that kind of three-time a day prayer. Um, doesn't ordain praying toward Jerusalem. Although there, some of that has developed. I was reading that some synagogues around the world, there's where the front, where the they keep the scrolls, faces towards Jerusalem. But 
That's not, he just, he just did that. He just did that to show his loyalty. Although we do have Psalm 55, if you look at Psalm 55, verse, oh, I don't need to look it up, I have it written down. Psalm 55, 17, evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. So maybe Daniel was pulling on that song. The Old Testament also makes many different prayer postures. It doesn't endorse just one. Lifted, outstretched hands, to sit, to stand, to kneel, to fall down, to cry out, lots of different postures. The point is, Daniel's prayer is a symbol of dependence on God, a symbol of humility, and a symbol of, of uh, contrition before God. The law of man here against the law of God. I read this quote from one of my commentaries and I thought it was so good. When prayer is fashionable, it's time to pray in secret. Matthew 6, 5 and 6. But when prayer is under pressure, to pray in secret is to give the appearance of fearing the king more than God. Hmm. When prayer is fashionable, like, you know, look at me, I'm praying. That's a good thing. It's time to pray in secret. But when prayer is under pressure, to pray in secret is to give the appearance of fearing the king more than God. Daniel prayed where he knew he would be seen. He, this was a deliberate act of nonviolent civil disobedience. I'm going to pray right here in front of the window. They can see it. Daniel and his friends had already publicly taken stands against idolatry, chapter 3, sacrilege in chapter 5, personal commitment to purity in chapter 1, personal commitment to prayer in chapter 2, and there will be more to come. The exiles were willing to say, nope, not going to do that, to public practices that were incompatible with their commitment to God. And to say yes, to personal practices and public practices that were essential to the commitment to God. So Daniel's three times a day prayer is a model of bravery and commitment, and that'll preach too. You know, I, I had to pause there a little bit and think about when when I read um, we need prayer back in schools, and when when prayer was taken out of schools, and I think what, what is the example here of Daniel? We need to teach our kids that no one can take prayer out of you. It goes with you wherever you go. And to, to teach them, you know, using this story of Daniel, that prayer is as much a part of us as breathing is. And we should not fear that. Be confident in that. Surely he could read behind, between the lines of that decree um, <laughs> they're, they're, they're after me. They're certainly after me with this one. But it didn't matter. He wasn't about to give up on God. He'd lived a very long time as an exile. And he endured many things. And like I said last week, he was probably over it. <laughs> over these folks trying to get him. His faith in Yahweh was just as strong as it has been as a young lad. 11 to 15. Then these men went as a group, and I just pictured them hanging out in the alley. Peeking around the corner. <laughs> found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So two aspects of Daniel's prayer, giving thanks, asking for help. The tattletales, peeking in the windows, Daniel didn't try to hide a thing. So he went to, they went to the king, probably delighted delighted. Got him. Spoke to the king about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The, the, uh, the idea here is this happened on the first day. <laughs> the king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, so cue the epic swelling of dramatic music, Daniel, 
who's one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing, he still prays three times a day. And when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. So the rest of that day, we don't know what he did. Looking through the laws, bring me all of the laws of the land so I can look through and see if there's any loophole to help me rescue Daniel. These rascals have tricked him. He must have liked Daniel. I mean, he was going to put him in charge of the whole land. At the end of the day, the scoundrels returned, and the men, they went as a group to King Darius and said, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. Jealousy and hatred, once again, is what moves these guys to their brutal treatment to permanently remove Daniel from Babylon. Not just from leadership, permanently remove him. Darius hopes for deliverance. Daniel's deliverance. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, and I imagine this as sort of a final whisper, may your God, who you serve continually, rescue you. So historians state that there's no archaeological evidence of uh, archaeological being physical and written that uh, ancient dens of lions to kill people. Uh, lions do not naturally live in dens or pits. Lions are mentioned in pits in 2 Samuel 23.20 and 1 Chronicles 11.22, but in terms of hunting them, like we dig a pit and a lion can fall in, kill, um, but not maintaining them in a pit. So there, there, there are records of kings keeping lions in cages for sport. Uh, lions, and in scripture as well, and in history, are a symbol of power. Ancient writings, uh, out, extra biblical writings, in ancient writings, a den of lions was used metaphorically to describe ruthless colleagues or wicked competitors. So there's that wordplay. So these, these wicked uh, administrators, satraps, are compared to this this ruthless place of death. But we have no reason not to believe this pit of lions was real, um, but it also is a, is a demonstration of, again, comparing these people to this, this certain death. A stone, 17, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. There's no hope of human intervention now. The leaders went home to celebrate, but the king went back to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. We've all been there, right? Now we begin to echo those things. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den, and when he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. You know, we really get this, this, this trauma that this has caused to the king. Daniel, servant of the living God. Servant of the living God. This means God who's alive, who's active, who's powerful, who's awesome, who's almighty. Has your God, whom you serve continually, he recognizes Daniel's integrity been able to recognize you from the lions. So this might be a reference to a Babylonian custom that if someone who was accused of a crime is uh, tortured and they survive the torture, they're pardoned. It might be a, a very similar to, to that. Daniel answered, may the king live forever customary greeting for the king, also used by the satraps, um, makes you think of Jesus' words in Matthew 22, 21. So give to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. He's, he's giving legal honor. May the king live forever. And I think Daniel's amazingly calm, <laughs> having spent the night in a petting zoo. <laughs> May my God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. 
the same, my God sent his angel. Is this the same one that was in the fiery furnace? The same one who when emphasizes that the faithful will experience God's presence in the midst of trial. They have not hurt me, said Daniel, because I was found innocent in God's sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. Yeah. The living God is victorious. Daniel did break the law, that 30-day law, but he's never been disloyal to the king like the other group of the king's leaders who manipulated the king, who used him. Um, Daniel's saying, I, I have never done anything wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed. Overjoyed. I like that, that image. And gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he trusted in his God. So faithful, even if. The king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown in the lion's den, along with their wives and children. Oh, that's just... Several of the commentaries I read said that this is one of the most gruesome passages of the Bible. But it emphasizes this ancient practices uh, for accomplices to conspiracies were also punished rather than just individual responsibility. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. <laughs> now, this painting that I found, this ancient painting. Uh, I was telling Angie that when I put it up here on the screen and blew it up, where it circled, that's that's the ball of a femur. And, and the, the shaft of the, of the femur is crunched. <laughs> Whoever did the painting long, long time ago, and I'm like, that's, and it's right beside Daniel. That, that just that little detail, popped out at me when I read this script, or this passage. Really emphasized Daniel standing there whole. But some did not receive the same mercy. The doxology. Like his predecessor Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, so all his kingdom. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of lions. Again, literally and figuratively. The, the, the actual furry animals and the animals in human flesh who tried to take him down. So if you compare Nebuchadnezzar's letter in chapter 4 to this letter. So let's look at chapter 4, 1 of 3. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. It's my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. And 34 and 35. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes. Remember, this was after he had been reduced to an animal state raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored and I praised the most high. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the prophets of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? So he didn't quite issue, he didn't quite, Nebuchadnezzar didn't go as far as, as Darius did. Darius said, you know, everybody, everybody must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. But both make the same claim. God is sovereign. 
there's hope. These these passages, you know, there's hope for everyone, even those with all this power, to to recognize God Almighty and to follow him faithfully as Daniel did. Daniel's success again. Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So, faith under pressure. This is from the World Biblical Commentary. The hero is not only a man of insight and uprightness, but a man of remarkable spirit, a God-given spirit, as we compare him to 5, 11, and 12. A man of faithfulness to God in life and in prayer and of trust in God in danger. His persecutors see where his vulnerability lies. Interesting that the world sees our faith in God as a vulnerability. He believes in obeying God rather than human beings when these obligations are made to conflict. For his insistence, he will pay with his life. So our faith heroes in Daniel have endured both fiery and furry trials. And the faithful who refuse to obey human law when it conflicts with God's law may find themselves in prison or worse. And that's still going on in the world. Still going on. Sometimes those who stand in nonviolent civil disobedience because of their faith in God are delivered. Let's look at Psalm 91, 9 and 13, which Daniel, uh, you know, maybe this was one of the songs where he just, Leaned on this, on this psalm. Psalm 91, verse 9. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone, stone, you will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. And Psalm 124. I think that uh, sometimes I forget how, you know, the Psalms speak to us, but how the Psalms would have, would have spoken to these ancients. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, if the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive when their anger flared against us. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth, who have escaped like a bird from the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. So the message of Daniel 6 is not that the innocent, believing, faithful confessor of God can always be expected to be delivered from martyrdom. The promise of Daniel 6 must be held in a broader sense. So turn to Romans 8. 36 and 37. Familiar passages. 36. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in, in all things, all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels or demons nor present or the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and, and you know, you imagine Paul sitting there and remembering these stories of faith and in his situation where he has been attacked and thrown into prison and they've been attacked and believers as they go out and nothing can separate us from God from the love of God in Christ Jesus and 2 Timothy 4 
16 through the 18. And my defense, no one can come to my support. Everyone, just sorry, let me start over. At my defense, says he says, no one came to my support. Everyone deserted me. But don't hold that against me. The Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. He certainly, were holding this, he certainly was holding the story of Daniel as an example. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So in, in as the early Christians were, were experiencing this, the, the, the leaders, the rulers, the religious leaders coming after them, and they're standing firm, standing at the window praying. They're counting on this. God can deliver me here, but even if he doesn't, I will be delivered into his presence. All of that history comes to support that. As a promise and proclamation for the Jews in exile and for the early Christians who were eventually persecuted by Rome and were thrown to lions in the Colosseum where they were ripped apart. Don't compromise your faith in God Almighty. Hebrews 11. The hero chapter, right? The faith hero chapter. Hebrews 11, starting in verse... 32. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle, and routed foreign emperor, uh, armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced years and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, this is another great couple of verses that's plucked out of context, right? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, since we are surrounded by people like that, who stood firm in the face of lions and persecution and deaths. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It's the strength of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah's testimony in Daniel 3. We will not bow down and worship your idol. We will not. God, can, God will deliver us from this furnace, but even if he doesn't, he is still God Almighty. So I mentioned the last time we talked about martyrdom and persecution, um, I went back to uh, the Voice of the Martyrs website, Open Doors, and a lot of organizations that, that are working on supporting Christians around the world who are persecuted and killed. Just read some of those stories. I mean, we're reading these ancient stories. Read some stories that are happening now. The people who stand firm, who stand at the window and pray. I think that's a good image. I, we should make that. We should make that our phrase, right? I'm gonna stand at the window and pray. <laughs> I like that one. I'm gonna get shirt with that one. <laughs> so I pulled up my little 
little book, uh, Praying with the Anabaptists again. Back in, this would have been, yeah, 15, 28. It would have been easy for Anabaptist prisoners to doubt God's leading. Great courage was required to turn away from traditional religion and become members of a persecuted religious minority. Discerning God's will became a necessary everyday task and one fraught with danger. With their eyes wide open, they needed to listen critically and carefully to preachers and priests and respond with love to their interrogators in the prisons. Yet the Anabaptists persisted in trusting God and treating their enemies with respect. 1528, 18 Anabaptists were captured, tortured, and sentenced to the fire at Salzburg, Austria. And together they wrote the following prayer and left it as a memorial. And I want to close with this prayer, but I also want to open uh, for questions or comments. Stories from Brethren history. You can tell me those too. <laughs> yes, Harold. A comment in relation to the lion's den. Yeah. Saddam Hussein's son in modern Iraq kept several lions in his home mm. in an enclosure. Iraq is in the area we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Saddam Hussein's son kept lions in his home in a cage. So, Symbol of power. Yeah. So maybe this is what one of the king's sons was keeping alive and threw yeah. it with him. Yeah. Very much. What are symbols of power now that our money and fame threats to our faith? Security, promise of security. Language. Language. Tell me more about that. How we speak. Put people down. Uh, yeah, we we heard that repeatedly in Daniel, haven't we? Wisdom and tact, and 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 saying, you know, he never he never spoke kindly to the king in the throne room, and then put him down in the parking lot. Language. There's a there's a lot. I there's m much ink <laughs> has been spilled over um, we shouldn't get too comfortable in, in America with our freedoms. We shouldn't get too comfortable. So how do these stories prepare us. While we have our freedoms, what are we doing to bolster our, our strength in God? So that when we need it, it is there instantly. I think that's, that to me is, is where I come out after reading the story. And what am I doing right now to honor my God? So that it's just as natural as breathing when that might be threatened. I'll pray this, this prayer, the prayer of 18 martyrs. O oh God of heaven, watch over your sheep who are such a little flock that we may not depart from you or be led astray. Keep us under your protection and sustain us in your will. Grant that those who teach false doctrine, doctrine may amend their steps and do your will. Fill us with your divine power, O God, for we have no other Lord in heaven and earth but you. Amen. For the testimony before they were led to the fire. Next Sunday's class, um, we start on chapter 7. Chapter 7 is a hinge. We start talking about Daniel's visions. So I'd like you this week to really think about um, what happened.
have you heard about Daniel's vision? What have you learned about apocalyptic literature? How did you learn it? Um, we're just going to start there a little bit with understanding some of these visions. Woohoo!